Okay, this morning I have a message and I've entitled it Unbalanced Scales. It's from Psalms chapter 73. Before we go there, um, I want to just do a little side note as to who the author is. I'm, I'm, in my mind, I thought originally it had to be David. But there's an uh, opening verse in verse 1. It says, to the, it says uh, a psalm of Asaph. Now, this is not to be confused with Aesop's fables, okay? Some of you guys remember this as a kid. There was the stories of uh, the wolf and crying wolf and then the, the golden eggs. That's the, the stories that he was familiar with and he was a writer during the time of the 620 to around 564 BC. I'm not talking about him, okay? What I'm talking about this morning, Asaph, is a man who in, in David's time, he said this in 1 Chronicles 631, he identified him and said, these are the men David put in charge of music in the house of the Lord after the ark came to rest there. They ministered with music before the tabernacle, the tent of meeting, until Solomon built the temple of the Lord in Jerusalem. They performed their duties according to the regulations laid down for them. And in verse 39, you actually see Asaph's name came up along with his brother and his father. And so we find out who this man is. He is a Levite, a priest, a leader of David's choir. His name means assembler, one who gathers together, a collector of the people. Asaph was a young priest from the tribe of Levi when David brought in the Ark of the Covenant. Remember the first time it came into Jerusalem and David was dancing around 1000 BC. His father, his father Barakah, was appointed doorkeeper of the Ark. And Asaph was so talented that David put him in charge of the music before the Ark of the Covenant. He was probably in his 20s at the time when most of the priests would have been in Gibeah. Asaph was in charge of the music in Jerusalem and before the ark and the king. Now Asaph kept that position until the time that the temple was dedicated in Jerusalem for almost 40 years later. Asaph served in Jerusalem under David's reign and then he would also serve under Solomon's reign. He saw the death of David, the ascension of Solomon, and the building of the temple. He thought he was standing on the verge of Israel's millennial reign. He was on a mountaintop. After Solomon's dedication of the temple, Asaph saw Israel's golden age turn into something quite different. Solomon turned his back on God and pursued wealth and power and luxury and human wisdom, as well as worshiping other gods. Asaph saw all this, and it is in this time frame that we see Asaph in, in Psalms chapter 73. I was reminded of myself of, of when we come to the Lord, simply coming to the Lord, and, or simply the, the idea in our minds that we hear sometimes, which is karma, which is just simply doing something good and good is going to come back to you. Be faithful to God and be, He will be faithful to you. If He doesn't heal you, that wouldn't be fair, would it? He, in fact, we have books out today, The Blessed Life. We have Your Best Life Now. Everything that we do in our lives is geared towards us and how we feel and what makes us happy. Actually, our church is, is living the American dream, if it were so. But the psalmist begins here in verse 1, and he says this. In verse 1, surely God is good to Israel, to those who are pure in heart. The general idea of this psalm is stated in this verse. God is good to Israel, and to those that are clean of heart. He is a true friend to the righteous. He, re he gives his favor on those who have virtue. Those who are favorable are the righteous of God. We will see mental conflicts go on within Asaph's life, though, as he begins to, to, to dis, disrobe or just uh, open up this, this, this um, psalm. It's an, there's an agitation, there's a perplexity that he goes through. In spite of what I feel or what I, uh, or what I see, God is good. When I hear this, the first thing I think of is what is our idea of what good looks like? Is it the same as God's? See, is, is our idea of good the same as God's idea of good? See, my idea of good makes me feel good. God's idea of good may not make me feel good. It may bring pain. 
He says in verse 2 there, he says, But as for me, my feet had almost slipped. I nearly lost my foothold. The word there when it says slip means poured out. As though instead of being something solid be below his feet, he was, it seems as though everything was under him was melting. He had nothing. It was being poured out. He was like a falling man who had no strength to walk. No place firm to put his feet. And then in verse 3 it says, For I envied the arrogant when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. When I saw the prosperity of the wicked, more literally, the peace of the wicked would be a better reference. It's not so much about their prosperity, but about their peace, their conscious safety, their freedom from trouble, especially calamities. Their calmness in spite of all this, their freedom from suffering, all this opened doubt for Asaph. Where was God in all this? Many of us have thought this. It would be easier if the wicked were punished immediately. It could be easier to see their failure and their punishment, the results right after. Then we could say, we could say, we could look at what the Bible talks about. Sowing and reaping would be very easy. But I want you to understand this morning, as this unfolds before us, I am not disregarding sowing and reaping, the consequences to our actions. This isn't punishment for bad behavior on Asaph's part. He is a man of God. He is a Levite. He is the, uh, the leader of, of David's choir. The psalmist then tells about his, his observations. His first observation is that life isn't fair. You can do good. You can be faithful. You can do all. And you can fall on hard times, even more difficult times than maybe those who are around us are wicked. Matthew talks about this in 5, chapter 44. Jesus tells us, he says, But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, that you may be children of your Father in heaven. He causes the sun to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. Now, you're not going to believe this. As I was looking up commentaries on that particular verse, there was many commentaries that argued against this, that this doesn't happen. This would not be right, you know, if God's faithfulness, almost as if we sit under a different sun than the rest of the world. Or that when it rains, we don't get the same rain because we are blessed, we have a favor of God, that we're somebody different. We are the chosen ones, the blessed ones. We have a different sun and, and, and rain, of course. See, God does interject himself at times. God does part the sea. God does reach his hand down and touch men and women in this life. He heals them. But in the midst of what goes on around us, Asaph sees this picture of exactly what's going on. The sun rising, the sun setting on both us and the world. And the psalmist continues to say this. He said this. He said in verse 4, they have no struggles. Their bodies are healthy and they're strong. In fact, the King James Version says it like this, there are no bands in their death, but their strength is firm. I wanted to read Albert Barnes's notes on this very particular scripture. He says it like this, for there are no bands in their death. The word rendered bands here means properly, cords tightly drawn. The word occurs here and in Isaiah 58, 6. The fact that, that gave them so much uneasiness was that this so often occurs that when the wicked die, they do not seem to suffer in proportion to their wickedness. Or there seems to be no special marks of divine displeasure as they are about to leave the world. They have lived in prosperity and they die in peace. There is no uncommon agony in their death. There is no special alarm about the future world. They have enjoyed this world and the sinful life now to be followed by a peaceful death. They do not even suffer as much in death as good people do. So what is the advantage of piety? And how can we believe that God is just or he's a friend to the righteous or even if there is a God? Spurgeon said it like this. He said he fell asleep like a child, says his friends, and others exclaim he was so happy that he must be a saint. Oh, this is but an apparent end. But God knoweth that the dying repose of sinners, but the awful calm which heralds the eternal hurricane they're about to go through. They may die in peace in this world. And I want you to know that sometimes as I, as I was reading this, this chapter, I was thinking to myself, God, this is what it looks like in our world today. The godly are suffering, and those who are, are wicked, those who are just, just frivolous in their life, seem to just have it so easy. 
Asaph went on, he says this in verse 5, They are free from common human burdens. They are, they are not plagued by the human ills. Literally, in the labor of man, they are not. That is, they are exempt from the common burdens and troubles of humanity. They seem to have some special favor to save them from the common calamities which come upon this race. The second part, literally, is it that with mankind they are not afflicted or smitten. The calamities which come so thickly and heavily on the race do not seem to come upon them. They are favored, they prosper, they're happy, while others are afflicted. Spurgeon said it like this. While many saints, poor and afflicted, the prosperous sinner is neither. He is worse than other men, and yet he is better off. He plows lease, and yet has the most fodder. He deserves the hottest hell, and yet has the warmest nest. In verse 6, he says this, Therefore pride is their necklace. They clothe themselves with violence. They wear it like an ornament. It, is, it makes it conspicuous. It's apparent upon their haughty necks. In an erect, stiff de demeanor, they, they clothe themselves with violence like a garment. Injustice and cruelty seems to be their very clothing. It is manifest in their whole gait and demeanor the way they live. There's no sympathy or sensibility about them. I want to pause just for a moment. As we would expect in a poetic outpouring, Asaph was exaggerating. The life of the wicked was not as good as he observed, nor was the life as his life as bad as he felt it to be. Yet what can, one cannot deny or contradict the feeling that prompted Asaph in this psalm, and we can instead strongly identify with that feeling. I can. It's in perspective. See, it's... It's truly, and it's in our perspective of how we look at things. One day, a father of a very wealthy family took his son on a trip to the country for the purpose of showing his son how poor people live. They spent a couple of days and nights on the farm of what would be considered a very poor family. On their return from their trip, the father asked his son, How was your trip? It was great, Dad. Did you see how poor people li live? The father asked. Oh, yeah, said the son. So what did you learn from the trip? Asked the father. The son answered, I saw that we have one dog and they have four. We have a pool that reaches to the middle of our garden. They have a creek that has no end. We have imported lanterns on our garden and they have stars at night. Our patio reaches to the front yard and they have a whole horizon. We have a small piece of land to live on and they have fields that go on beyond sight. We have servants who serve us, but they have others around them who help them. We buy our food, we, but they grow theirs. We have walls around our property to protect us. They have friends to protect them. With this, the father's son was, the father was speechless. His son added, thanks, Dad, for showing me how poor people live. In verse 7, he says, From their callous hearts comes iniquity. Their evil imaginations have no limits. Remember last week I said that the word callous means fat. From their fat hearts comes iniquity. Here it is again. Their evil imaginations have no limits. The idea here is that their thoughts, their plans, their purposes pass through freely without any obstruction. Their wishes are all gratified. Their purposes are accomplished. They have all they wish. Whatever comes into mind of an object or a desire, it is obtained without hindrance or even trouble. They seem only to wish for a thing, and then they have it. Does that sound like the world around us at times? When we look at ourselves and think, God, yeah, ain't I, aren't I supposed to be your special one? But you see all this going on around us. And then in verse 8, he says this. He says, they scoff and they speak with malice. and arrogance, they threaten the oppression. They literally, the, the Hebrew word, one of the first times we've seen it, is the Hebrew root word for mock. And it says this. It means derived from the same thing that we see today pertaining to God. They actually scoff. They speak with malice. They're arrogance. They threaten, they threaten oppression. They use this kind of arrogant language to speak in a proud manner as though they were above others. They use harsh and violent language, not regarding the feelings or rights of others. Who was Asaph speaking about here, though? Was he speaking about the godless around him? Or was he speaking about those? Remember, he's a priest. He's not really mixing with the common folk. 
And then in the next verse, I think it makes it a little clearer who he's talking about. In verse 9, their mouths lay claim to heaven and their tongues take possession of the earth. They speak as though they are clothed with all authority, as if they are superior beings. They had the right to command the universe. As to their tongue, there is no limit. They can say and say, do as they please. They have no regard to God, no regard to God's sovereignty. And sometimes as I was looking at this, I was thinking, God, this is somehow how the church operates today. We have neglected God's sovereignty that he can do as he pleases. He says, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy. But we say in the church today, listen, I can determine what God is going to do. And I can speak for him on his behalf. And I can tell you how it's supposed to be. Because his word declares it's supposed to be this way. And we take our opportunity to speak on behalf. Their tongues take possession of the earth. The next verse says, Therefore their people turn to them and drink up waters in abundance. They being the righteous, he's talking about here. Therefore their, their people turn to them and drink up waters in abundance. It means here it's, it's that they continue to hear this over and over and over again. More perplexed and more embarrassed, the difficulties suggest that now all of a sudden they have to drink it up, which actually means to suck it up, to actually to drink it greedily. Isaiah 51, 17, it says it's applied to the same word it's used there. It talks about an intoxicating drink, the one who drinks from the cup of poison to its dregs. In Psalm 75, 8, the meaning here is also is that when they were so perplexed that they would drink of the poison, it became like an intoxicating drink. It was overpowered their very faculties. They did not merely taste it, but they drank it. They exhausted the cup. They say in verse 11, how would God know? Does the Most High know anything? I was listening to a TV preacher this week, and I was thinking, he was saying, he was, he was talking about, well, if it couldn't be this way. If, 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 if God's going to heal here, he's got to heal over here. And if he doesn't, then that would be unfair of him. And he was saying how he was going to speak for God and how it was supposed to be. And I thought to myself, huh, isn't that almost how we, the Scripture's talking about right here? We speak on behalf of God. God, it's got to be a certain way. You've planted your favor on me. I must be blessed. But Asaph saw something different. See, in this verse here, it says, the connection demands that the, the next verse here, 11, be attached to 10, where he talks about that they would be compelled by these facts to say these inquiries about God. So, when you go back to the verse before that, for their... Therefore, their people turn to them and drink up waters in abundance. That is tied to the next verse where he's saying, because they've drank this intoxicating, this, this elixir that is basically deadly. And this is talking about the people of God. This isn't talking about the world. This is talking about the godly. He says, now he says that this is what the wicked are like. Always free to care, they go on amassing wealth. They become great in substance. They make their constant accumulations. Almost as if I see sometimes, I think, this is what the church has become. We have become a wealth and health and prosperity gospel. But reality is, Asaph gives us what the gospel really looks like. When we come to Jesus, it isn't all flowers and roses. It's a difficult experience. And sometimes it looks fair. And sometimes the balances of the scales don't seem right. James Boyce, a theologian and author, he says this, if, if God is in control of things, the plans of the wicked should flounder. They should even be punished openly. The God, godly alone should prosper. But that is not what Asa saw. And it is not what we see either. We see scoundrels getting rich. We see the utterly degenerate persons, rock, rock musicians and movie stars, well paid and sought after. Even criminals getting rich selling their crime stories. I was thinking about it this week as I was watching another tragic bus accident of a youth group that was going on their missions trip. It seemed like every time I turn on the, the news, there's some kind of tragedy of a church bus out of, of Texas or out of Mississippi or an elderly group going somewhere. And I thought to myself, God, how is it there are not that many buses on the road, but yet there are those that are going to the casino every day and nothing happens to those buses at all. 
There are buses traveling to Las Vegas and Atlantic City and nothing's happening to them, yet these godly people are being destroyed because these death, these deathly accidents. It is at this point that the man of God questions his very position. He says, what have I been doing? He says it like this in verse 13. Surely in vain I have kept my heart pure and have washed my hands in innocence. He basically says, why am I even doing this? Some of us have said that even as we've tried to walk this relationship with Jesus out. It is difficult. It is hard. Asaph said it here. He's a priest. He says, listen, why have I done this? Has it been in vain? Has it been for emptiness? There is no advantage in my efforts at all to become pure and holy. It does not assist me in obtaining the favor of God. It would be just as well if I lived a sinful life, to indulge in this, the pleasures of life. Nothing is to be gained in all my painful efforts at self-discipline by all my endeavors to become righteous. It would have been better for me if I had lived like a sinner just like the other people. It seems as though the righteous are subject to more trouble, more sorrow, more conflict, more warfare, more pain. And this is what Asaph sees. See, we live in times today of prosperity, sex, success, and favor. The flavor of the church today is that, that very word. It's always been, it always seems like it's been this way. I remember I grew up in this. My wife, I mean, she grew up in that. When she came to the Lord, she was in, she had been uh, in, in that gospel that just, that, that just took a hold of her. And there's nothing wrong with that gospel being the gospel that brought you to Christ. But what I want you to understand is the reality is... When Jesus said that you should count the cost before becoming a disciple, he meant that. He meant that this life was not going to be easy. This was going to be a difficult experience to walk it out before God. Some of you today are going to go, I don't even know why I even stay in. <laughs> I will be honest with you. If you're not going to be all in, you might as well serve the enemy and be all in on the other side, to be honest with you. I hate to say that, but that's the truth. Because wobbling around in that middle ground in that lukewarmness is the same as being on the other side. You might as well enjoy the sin. Our defini definition of favor is off. Tell me about John the Baptist who only lived to look almost 30 short years on this, on this earth and at a servant girl's whim who danced before the king, his head was served up on a platter. Tell me about godliness. Tell me about favor on this man. The one who Jesus said there is no man like him on all the earth. Talk about the New Testament go gospel about, that would make us rich. But the reality is, if you look at the New Testament, the book of Acts, these people gave up all they had. And the ones that hid it, perished. The ones who had, gave it to the others. That God had, had brought them together in such a time to be united as one. Not to, to flaunt what I have, to say, look where I'm at. But it was in reality to say, what can I give? In verses 9 and 10, I want you to just see these one more time. Their mouths like came to heaven, and their tongues take possession of the earth. Therefore the people turn to them and drink up waters in abundance. I think this is the church today. The scales are off balance. The way in which we value kingdom experience is skewed. The things that we look at today and we claim are, are God and are not God are off. In fact, Proverbs 11 one says, The Lord detests dishonest scales, but accurate weights find favor with Him. 23, Proverbs 20.23, 20, The Lord detests differing weights and dishonest scales do not please Him. He was not just talking about the physical scale. He was talking about our hearts. The disappointment is, is that some of us came to Christ. I know even myself, when I, was, when I would watch what was going on around me and what I've been taught, I've thought, I come to the Lord, everything's going to be good. Everything's going to be a lot easier. It was more difficult. I was tried. And 
Asaph said it like this in verse 14. All day long I have been afflicted, and every morning brings new punishments. How much more can I take, God? The chastisements that he is talking about here when he says punishments is not an ungodly punishment. It is exactly that. It is, it is that rebuking correction the word talks about there. So Asaph's saying, listen, while this is going on, while they're doing their own thing, I've been afflicted, and every morning I get a new punishment from you that you're telling me I have to do something different, that I need to change my direction, that, I, that I being, I'm being reproved. And then he says this in verse 15. He says, if I had spoken out like that, I would not have betrayed your children. He's basically saying this. He's saying, listen, it would be a lot easier. I wanted just to speak all this out. All this that's in my heart, this way that I feel, I want to just tell everybody about it. But I have to be careful. There's children. I can't tell them how, I'm, how disgusted I am and, and how I'm, I feel as though, like, like Francis Chan said when he was talking about his, his grandmother, he said, you know, I wanted to take this book that day and all the things that I had read, I just I thought I want to get rid of it because it just, it attacks us from within. It says, oh my goodness. In verse 16, he says this, when I tried to understand all this, it troubled me deeply. It burdened me. It was become such a labor. The question was a burden. It was too heavy, too weighty for me at times. How many times have we gotten to this point? It's too difficult for me to even think about. Don't talk about it. I don't understand God, and I'm having a difficult time here. But then in the next verse, he says this. He says, till I entered the sanctuary of God, then I understood their final destiny. See, his father was a doorkeeper to the ark. He was the worship leader in Jerusalem. He understood that the difficulty could not be resolved or solved by human reasoning. He understood that he needed to be close to God to fully understand what was going on around him. And even then, he may say, I don't understand this, but I know this, God, you've got a plan. These are things that can only be reasoned by God in his presence. It makes no sense outside of that. Ecclesiastes 12. Ecclesiastes 12. 13 and 14 says, Now all this has been heard. Here is the conclusion of the matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the duty of all mankind. For God will bring every deed into judgment, every, and every, including every hidden thing, whether it is good or evil. He gives us the point there. He says, fear God and keep his commandments. These are the duty of all mankind. Fear God and keep his commandments. Life is unfair. It does not make sense. I may not see my vindication in this lifetime. I know though this. God keeps a balance record. He has a balance sheet that is totally right and, judge, and, and is, it is correct in its judgment. I can't. As much as I try, and all of us, as best as we try to be fair and equal, we will never, it will always, always come back and we will always find ourselves kind of pushing over to our side. But when we put it in God's hands, he says this, listen, he is the righteous judge. He will judge those things little to big and he keeps a record. And then those things, whether in this life or the life to come, that's where the punishment will come. In this life, we may not see it. See, in Proverbs 16, 11 says, Honest scales and balances belong to the Lord. All the weights in the bag are for his making. Then Asaph goes on to say this. He says, Surely in vain. Surely you place them on a slippery ground. You cast them down to ruin. The place that he started, remember, he was on slippery ground. Remember, he had lost his footing. After he's been in the presence of God, he sees where it's really slippery. It's out there. Where I'm at is no longer slippery. I've got a firm foundation in God. See how suddenly things change. The perspective is gained in the house of the Lord as he sees the wicked ones now on the slippery slope. He says it like this. He says, how suddenly they are destroyed, completely swept away by terrors. They are like a dream when one awakes. When you arise, Lord, you will despise them as fantasies. I love the way Matthew Poole from the 1600s, he said it like this. 
Their happiness is like that of a dream, wherein a man seems to be highly pleased and transported with ravishing delights, but when he awakes, he finds himself deceived and unsatisfied. That's what this life is going to feel like when we wake up in his presence. So my heart was grieved, he says in verse 21. My heart was grieved and my spirit embittered when I was senseless and ignorant. I was a brute beast before you, yet I am always with you. You hold me by my right hand. You guide me with your counsel, and afterwards you will take me into glory. Whom, I, whom have I in heaven but you? And earth has nothing I desire besides you. The reality is, is that's where we need to plant ourselves. This earth has nothing I desire but you, God. His desire was for God alone. You see his humility when he says here, I'm, I was senseless and ignorant. I was a brute beast. The, the idea there is like a, a, a donkey who just bays out. It like, has no meaning. It's just, it's just this yelling forth that goes nowhere, that means nothing. His whole being may fail. He says in verse 26, I love this. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is, my, is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. His lot hasn't changed. I want you to see what he's saying there. My flesh and my heart may fail. Physically, things may not go the way I want them to go. But my strength is in you, God. That's where we have to get, because I will guarantee in these last days, the days that are coming... The last days, the Bible talks about in the book of Revelations that he will wear out the saints. We have to be in a place where we're prepared, we're ready for whatever the enemy dishes out. And he is going to dish out a meal that we do not want to partake of. He holds the scales in balance. He weighs the heart of man and his judgments are right. In Hebrews chapter 11.25, this is talking about Moses. It says, He chose to be mistreated along with the people of God rather to enjoy, than enjoy this fleeting sins of pleasure for a season. He regarded disgrace for the sake of Christ as greater value than the treasures of Egypt because he was looking ahead to his reward. That's what we need to be. We need to have our place that we look to, that we've got, a, we've got our, our eyes and our gaze set someplace else other than here. He chose to be mistreated. This is Moses. He chose to be mistreated along with the people of God. That's what the gospel looks like. He ends the chapter like this. Those who are far from you will perish. You destroy all who are unfaithful to you. But as for me, it is good to be near God. I have made the sovereign Lord my refuge, and I will tell of all your deeds. Being close to God is the place where we need to plant ourselves. Trusting God. I don't, under, I, fu I don't fully understand. Trust in His ways. I can't comprehend. Trust in His love that never fails. Trust in a cross with rusty nails. Mm. He ends with where he started here. Surely God is good to Israel, to those who are pure in heart. That's where God wants us. Surely God is good to Israel. This morning as we close. I wrestled with this message because I was like, God, I want to be able to give them everything else the world gives them. <laughs> I want to tell them everything is going to be great. You just serve the Lord and everything is going to fall into place for you. But reality is, serving God is difficult at times. Remember the story of Pilgrim. He comes to the mountain called difficulty. Danger and destruction to each side. He chooses to take the difficult path. It is difficult. Guys, I'm not going to lie to you. If you serve God with your whole heart, if you're a disciple or a follower of Christ, you're going to be attacked on every side at times. But it is always worth it. And just like Asaph saw these things moving to the left and the right of him, he said, I don't understand it, God. But I put my trust in you when I came into the sanctuary. That relationship with God, when I got close to him, everything got into balance.
That's what he wants for us today.